Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts. They're getting bigger. Big Anklevich. Wait, there's a nice little one over there. And Rish Outfield. <laughs> Is it safe? Is it safe? Guten Tag, Herr Enklovich. Guten Abend, Rich Outfield. Uh, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Willkommen. All right. Episode 81. I am Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Enklovich. Thank you for joining us. That's right. We're supposed to be doing some kind of German accent, though, huh? Ja. Well, where did the German come? Oh, from the story itself. Yeah. I'm the ever-competent announcer man. All right, so with us today, as usual, is announcer man. Yes, sir. And finally back from his personal business is 080T. <laughs> mm-hmm. Welcome back. Did you have a good time, 080T? <laughs> he says it's none of your business does he now we had a good time with you gone <laughs> we had a celebrity guest we had a robot that actually did his job good episodes i thought yeah uh, i thought they were okay you could learn a thing or two already have you checked out the uh, past episode while you were out <laughs> oh he says he was on vacation and he had much better things to do than that all right well see that sounds like a loaded question and we're supposed to say oh what were you doing but because I don't like the robot, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, you, you might want to check. You know, an interesting thing is we had ADRG here. Oh, you, you know ADRG? Okay. Yeah, he was here. Rish was really excited because he had the, the sound chip. Yes, that's right. It was great to be able to communicate with a robot on the same level, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, welcome back, Hoedo T, and uh, it, it's good to have you. We have a story today as well. For a change. Yeah. Uh, today's story is Forests of the Night by Abigail Hilton. I saw Jenny. She was bleeding. Saliva filled my mouth like I was smelling a box of chocolates. I said to Lieutenant Dan. Hey, I- what are you doing, Rish? Forest of the Night. It's the vampire forest gump. No. This is forest with one R, like, you know, with place with trees. Oh, shoot. Crap. Now here I have to come crawling back. Would you ask the robot to edit that out, please? Oh, wait, O.T., would you? Oh, yeah, he says good luck. All right. So uh, uh, when Abigail Hilton flopped, gasping onto the beach of a tiny unnamed key off the Florida coast, she was grateful that her audience included only a handful of seagulls, a raccoon, and one very surprised panther. The panther fled, along with the raccoon, but one of the curious seagulls hopped over to have a closer look at her. Moments later, now sticky with blood and feathers, she dragged herself into a tide pool. With the energy provided by her seagull meal, she formed a gelatinous cocoon where she lay dormant for months. She emerged looking almost completely human, with nary a scale or flipper. She walked up the beach and into the world where naturally she entered a medical profession. The scrubs and masks almost completely hid her gill slits. Come listen to her dark nautical fantasy, The Guild of the Cowrie Catchers, at www.cowriecatchers.com. Uh, this may be the first bio that has a beginning, middle, and end, <laughs> a character arc, and maybe we'll have music playing underneath. I guess, yeah. All right, so there you have it. We'd like to thank Julie Hoverson for lending her voice to today's story, and Liz Mirzievsky, who, oh, wait. No, 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 look, come on. You've gone to all the trouble of saying her name. But that's not her name anymore. It's something else. I think she got in a gelatinous cocoon and came out as Lizanne Hurd. <laughs> Lizanne Hurd, thank you for producing today's episode and also narrating it for us. Wonderful work. She wrote the theme tune. She sung the theme tune. You can check out links to everything 
in the show, the show notes. notes. The show. We've got a fabulous show notes here today. Forests of the Night by Abigail Hilton. Adele arrived at our small hospice late one afternoon. Her family, an impeccably dressed couple in their late 20s, hid behind sunglasses and surgically enhanced smiles. I wondered why they'd chosen our small establishment. They looked like they could afford something better. Adele trailed after them, an ancient woman following along like a lost puppy. She looked rumpled in her thin cotton shirt and trousers, somewhat stained. Her fine white hair gave the impression of a cartoon character who had just stuck a finger in an electrical socket. They told us she was 97 and in the final stages of terminal breast cancer. No, they just could not handle her anymore. Yes, she was confused, had been confused for years, even before the cancer. Yes, she had a tendency to wander. Here were her medical records, doctor's orders, and insurance information. Here was a very large check. Here were her belongings, one pitifully small suitcase. Here was their phone number. They would be in touch. Adele did not appear to understand any of this. A watercolor image of a woodland on the far wall caught her attention, and she stared at it while her grandson and granddaughter-in-law talked to the hospice administrator. I watched her family drive away and knew they would not be in touch. She had become a burden and an embarrassment. They would pay her bills and return only to collect her body. Looking at Adele, I did not think they would have long to wait. She was pitifully thin, with almost transparent skin stretched over webs of blue veins. Her eyes were a watery blue-gray. I introduced myself, but she did not seem to hear. I took her hand to lead her to her room, but she resisted. The painting had her full attention. The forests of the night, she muttered in a thick German accent. She touched the picture, looked at me. I felt sorry for her. How old were you when you came to this country? I asked. I did not expect an answer, but she said, Three hundred and seventeen. I smiled. She sighed. We all get old, eventually. I nodded. Yes, we all do. I want to run again, she whispered. That might be dangerous for you. Her toothpick legs did not look fit for walking, let alone running. Over the next few months, I revised my opinion of Adele's mobility. She was the worst wanderer we'd ever had. She was docile when accompanied by a staff member, but given the slightest opportunity, she would escape and not always via the front door. The staff caught her crawling out of windows, through fire exits, over the garden wall. Fortunately, she was slow and weak, and easy to catch. She never argued when we brought her back, just looked wistful. Our hospice grounds bordered an orange grove, and she always headed in that direction. Once, she succeeded in escaping for an entire day, and was found completely naked the next morning on the edge of the trees. She'd even removed her denture. She cried when we brought her back. I have forgotten how to verwandeln. Then she Suppose began muttering in German. She had moments of lucidity when she would talk of her children in their infancy, of lovers long dead, and of forests, always of forests. She would sometimes forget how to speak English and would prattle gravely in German for hours. Adele had other eccentricities. She craved meat, but wanted it undercooked, in spite of the fact that she hadn't a tooth in her mouth and her much-abused dentures could not handle rare steak. She hated to bathe, but if not carefully supervised, she would jump into the garden fountain and splash and sing and undress. She took off her clothes frequently in all kinds of places. I could understand why her family had become frustrated. Still, I wish they would at least call her. One day, she said plaintively, I've been dumped. And she rocked back and forth. They should have put me in a sack with a rock and tossed me in the river. Oh, honey, no, no, no. 
I held her hand. She forgot about it a moment later. Then, one day, Adele stopped eating. We encouraged her, spoke gently to her, but she said she was not hungry. This was a hospice, after all. People came here to die in peace. There would be no feeding tubes, no CPR, nothing to prolong her suffering. Her family was notified. I wished they would come to visit her, but they did not. Adele grew too weak to leave her room. She seemed sadder and more confused than when she'd arrived. She was constantly trying to remember how to verwundeln. I looked up the word in the German dictionary and discovered that it meant change. I wished I could change something for her. I took the picture of the forest from the front lobby and hung it in her bedroom. See, I told her playfully, I brought you the forest of the night. She stared at it all day. When she wasn't staring at the picture, she stared at the window. I made sure it was latched. I knew she wasn't strong enough to open the latch. She shouldn't have been strong enough to cross the room, but I had already learned not to trust her apparent weakness. Two days later, I was scheduled for the night shift. Around three in the morning, I heard a commotion from Adele's room. I opened the door and froze. Standing near the window, I saw a huge, pale gray wolf. I'd never seen a live one before, but there was no mistaking it for anything else. I opened my mouth to shout, and the wolf whined. I stopped. I looked for Adele and didn't see her, although her clothes were scattered about the room. Her dentures lay on the floor. The wolf came towards me. I saw that its legs were thin. Its coat was sparse, and its ribs showed. Its muzzle and face were frosted white. Its eyes were watery blue-gray. Hesitantly, I put out my hand. She's got no teeth, I thought stupidly. She sniffed. She whined again. As though in a dream, I walked across the room. I unlatched the window and opened it. The wolf gave a little cry. She bounded through the window into the light of a full moon, and she ran. I saw her run across the garden, up over the wall, and she was gone towards the grove. No one ever saw Adele again. I reported that I'd found her room empty. We searched for her, we put out media alerts, contacted the police. No one ever found a body. We expected a lawsuit, but her family seemed unsurprised and uninterested. I wonder how far she got. Probably a long way. I like to think that her old heart gave out running through the moonlight and the trees through the forests of the night. Author's Note Hi, I'm Abby. A few years ago, I heard a short story in which an old lady makes strange requests for raw meat. I can no longer remember either the author or the title, but I do remember being disappointed that she did not in fact, turn out to be an aging werewolf. I thought a werewolf with dementia would be a particularly sad and interesting old lady, so I sat down one afternoon and wrote the story. I am fond of stories in which monsters or mythical beasts appear at some point in their lives that we don't usually see them. Uh, Very young, very old, very ill, getting a prostate exam, (laughs) whatever. I hope you all enjoyed the story. Have we ever left in the in we're back? I don't know. You do that every week now. I do because people I've are, run out of ideas. People are sick and tired of you doing the same old thing, making fun of me doing the same old thing. Well, I see. I'm spent after the whole uh, celebrity Transformers guest. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. Okay, so we are back. I guess that was a story. That was very short. Yeah, it's shorter than uh, our normal fare. But it was good stuff, I thought. She said that she had been inspired by reading another story and expecting it to go a certain way and then being disappointed when it didn't. Uh huh. I've got so many stories that are like that uh, where I'd be watching a TV show or a movie or reading a story and going, ah, I know where this is going. This is going to be really cool. And uh, it didn't go that way. Uh-huh. And I'm just bummed. I'm like, wow, I, my idea was better. 
Uh, yeah, so you just come up with a different scenario that can lead to that same ending. Uh -huh. Have you ever done that? I think so, yeah. I think that's a pretty common, just the whole, I thought it should be like this and this would have been better kind of a thing just seems to be a pretty standard thing that people who like to write do. And, and you know, that's what they wind up going into writing, it seems, a lot of time. Where people are just like, this could get published? I could do better than that. And so they set out to do so. Back when we did uh, Princess of Earth by Mike Resnick, he said the same thing. He was watching Don Juan de Marco. And he said that that one didn't go the right way and that it turned out to be a bad movie and that he gets lots of his best ideas from failed from movies. From failed movies. So uh, I okay, think it's... Okay, so that's a common thing for I writers. I think it is. You've really, really been productive lately as far as writing goes. Or, or if not productive, you've been really revved up about writing. Do you want to talk about that for a minute since we are talking about writing and writers and uh, our own work? We could. I think it might take a long time to... Right, but the story it, was eight but, minutes long. Uh, on Twitter, I think somehow I got linked over by somebody to a certain writer's website. Dean Wesley Smith is the name of the writer, and he does this kind of how to write. And I think he's planning on making a book out of it eventually, but now they're just blog posts that he does every week or two. They're called Killing the Sacred Cows of Publishing. He says that he's going out and he's taking the myths that have developed in the publishing world and he's putting an end to those and saying, look, this is not the way it is, not the way it has to be. Like if you notice the score of a movie, then the composer is not doing his job. That, right, that right. Would... That's a myth, but that's not a myth of publishing. That would be a different kind of myth. But yeah, those kind of things, you know, he goes through and he debunks the myth for you. I don't know why it got me so pumped up about it, but... Uh, Hear me now and believe me later. Now, he's got a whole bunch of different posts that he's put on here over the years. A lot of them are about, like, agents, what an agent is supposed to do for you, what good an agent is. And, you know, there's a lot of myths that have been built up about what an agent can do to take care of you. But those posts are not really for me i mean maybe someday i'll need to know all that stuff but i'm kind of the the very beginning writer still he had a post like his first one that he talks about is just about speed and the myth is that if you write quickly then what you write must be crap but when somebody says oh i worked so hard on this story it took me five years to get this book finally finished. And, oh, well, of course, that's going to be a masterpiece because it took forever. But that's not likely to really be the case. I mean, there are some stories that took a long time to write and are great. It all just depends on what you're doing. And, like, one thing that he talked about in there was writing 250 words. You wouldn't think of that as being something difficult. You could probably put that out in how much time? What do you think? Let's say 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes probably. I mean, that's a page, 250 words. And yeah, if you did that every day, you'd have a full-length book in less than a year. 10 minutes a day is all you'd have to do to do that. When you really think about it, that's kind of ridiculous. You know, anybody can write at least like a 1,000 words in one sitting. And you can still probably get that out in less than, you know, an hour. If you're really putting your effort into it and really trying hard, you know, you can do an awful lot of writing if you actually work at it. So, you know, one of the other posts that he has is about rewriting. He does things, I think, a little different, a lot differently than what, like, myths have said, definitely. You know, there's the, the myth that he talks about, and this is that everything must be rewritten, you know, and polished and made to shine. And uh, he is, talks about writers need to write. They need to get practice. And that's one of the other things that I really needed to hear, I think. Because, I mean, we've talked about that on here a lot, about how we just don't write. Oh, we'd love to, but, you know, there's a lot of porn that needs to be downloaded. And it's not going to download itself. <laughs> we talk a lot about how we want to write, but we don't. He kind of compares that to you like a professional athlete or, or somebody who's learning an instrument. If you want to be good, you got to practice. you got to learn your trade. you got to be doing it all the time. And you've got to practice on certain things, for example. He calls it focused practice. Yeah, You practice on making believable characters or on cliffhanger endings or whatever it is that you want to work on. And you work on that and work on that until you've got it down, just like a 
basketball player stands at that free throw stripe and throws it and throws it and throws it until he can put it in basically every time. It's the same thing. If you want to be a professional writer, you've got to be as good as a professional basketball player is at your own task. And so you got to sit down and you got to do it and you got to write a lot a day. And yeah, I don't know. This stuff just excited me. It got me uh, energized thinking, you know, if I just practiced, I could get to that point. And I guess that's the rub there. And I think it's something probably like 99.9% of people that want to be writers just don't put the effort into it that it takes to become a great writer. And then there's those people that do, and those are the ones that are out there being published and making a living and so forth as writers. And I guess that's the thing that I need to learn to do. I still have problems with it. I got really excited about it a few months ago, and I started working on it, and I was putting on my blog and saying, oh yeah, I wrote this many words today, and this kept going every day. And yeah, there's always something that comes along that sidetracks me, and I just need to find some way to push through that. He mentions, I can't remember who it is that said it, the person who famously said that you got to write one million words of crap before you become the writer that isn't writing crap. Now, see, I remember when you said that to me, and I had always heard that it was 100,000 words. <laughs> and when you said a million, I was like, oh, no, in today's dollars, <laughs> it's a million words. That's that, maybe that's it. And uh, that just inflation has gone I was up. Like, oh, no, now I have to do the math. And see if I'm still writing crap. <laughs> Warning, today's comments from Rish Outfield are especially stupid. Listener discretion is advised. When you first were all into this, and you just couldn't wait to tell me what you had learned. In fact, you had printed out these myths. That's and right. you said, Yo, this is a, my gift to you <sighs> and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Take this and meditate upon it. You were telling me about some of these myths. And I got really angry, <laughs> not only at this guy, but at you. And I was just like, no, these are not myths. Do you remember what the one was that I got so mad about? It was one of the first couple. It wasn't was the Was it the rewriting one? one? Maybe it was. Where he says you don't ever rewrite. You just got to start from the beginning and rewrite it completely from uh, scratch. I still hate that one. But no, that's not <laughs> the one. You said that and I was just seething. I was like one of those guys who's like, that rule doesn't apply to me. <laughs> <laughs> And then I read these things that you'd given me, and right there on that same post, he said, a lot of people are going to be angry at me for saying this. And I was just like, yeah. And it was weird because that sort of took the wind out of my sails when he said that. The fact that he acknowledged that what he was saying was going to be unpopular or incendiary, one of those big words that if I were a real practicing writer, I would uh, be able to use in conversation. And it sort of made me think, okay, well, I, I can read this with a more open mind. The thing, These things that he proclaims as myths, I mean, a lot of them I hold to as truth. Uh -huh. You know, I hold these truths to be self-evident. <laughs> and one of the things that I have said on this show a hundred times, more than I've ever talked about Firefly or quoted Star Wars, is that writing is hard. Uh -huh. And I think it was his second or third myth where he's like, writing is not hard. He's like, what would you rather do? Would you rather go dig a ditch or sit down in an air-conditioned room and write a story? And okay, yes, yeah, when, you, when put you put it, it that, that way, way, it's not it's not hard physically. But yeah, if there were any points that made me want to accost this guy in, in a <laughs> dark alley somewhere, I think that was the one where he's like, anybody can write. But that's not work. <laughs> it takes no talent and all that. And I, I don't think he like, went that far. He did. I think he was trying to encourage people that it's not hard work in that sort of a way. It's not back-breaking labor. It's much better to be a writer for a living than it is to be a ditch digger. I hear you. And it's fun. You've got to admit that. I may have to argue on all of these points. You've got to admit you, it's how, fun. How many writers have you heard say that there is nothing scarier than a blank page? <laughs> okay, I've heard that. Hundreds of times. Every writer has said that. Because every writer knows what it's like to be here and say, okay, I'm going to write, and they can't do it. Uh -huh. Or nothing is coming, or they've hit a wall, and it's like, oh, shoot, what does the guy do now? How do they get out of this? The child molester saves the world. <laughs> Like I'm always saying that I read somewhere that more people fear public speaking than death. fear death. <laughs> now, somebody like your buddy could say, oh, come on. Somebody puts a gun to your head and says, stand up in front of this crowd. Stand and up speak. in front of this crowd and tell them 
where you come from and, and, and what your childhood was like and all that, or I'm going to pull the trigger, all of them would stand up and all that. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's false. I, I, <laughs> when you compare things like that, yeah, okay, of course you're going to get the desired result. See, I'm getting all uh, into it again like I was that <laughs> night. I was so mad at you for buying into this religious yeah. whack job. Drinking that to, Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah. man, I was so gone. The, the night <laughs> time is the right time. time. But here we are again. Okay, but but it lit a fire under you. It and did. reading these things about him, I mean, okay, the one that you were going on and on about was just write it, just get it out there. Don't sit and dwell on every single word and say that it has to be perfect and do all this stuff. Just write it and move on and go to the next story because you'll get better as you go and on all that stuff. And I was just like, well, but what about these three stories that I just wrote? And he's like, <laughs> F them. And I'm like, it doesn't say F them. He, he says, does. It's move on. He says, Send those, those are the past. Out. Never. Don't look back in anger, my friend. What, he's telling you, don't just keep rewriting them and rewriting them and rewriting them until by the time you're done they've still six years later never seen an editor nobody's ever looked at it to see oh yeah i will buy this okay when you put it that way again <laughs> gun to my head i agree with you <laughs> but when he talked and when you were talking that night i was just so angry we're just like ah i worked for three months on this how dare you say it's not work or whatever it was you know just i became wallace sean and that's not a good thing, folks. Yeah. I was bitten by Wallace Shawn on a moonlit night. And now, when the moon is full and bright, I too say, Inconceivable! 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 It's really kind of ugly when that happens. Okay, I but, will be quiet and let you talk. Now. But that's an important thing. And like you said, you've got to practice. And rewriting, he says, isn't practice. That's like tinkering. That's like sitting and erasing a tiny corner or something off of your drawing that you've done and maybe coloring it in slightly different oh wait no i'm gonna oh oh wait and you just keep messing with it and messing with it and messing with it and never moving on and practicing further you you maybe you don't agree with that but that's something i just needed to hear because i haven't written that much i mean you've got story after story i mean you could just pull out a trunk and it would be friggin full of printed out papers dating all the way back to 1984 when you wrote the first one about the pumpkin patch in your third grade class or whatever. Wait, that was my story. Sorry. Oh, you... But uh, I don't have that many. I have like 10 stories and I keep messing with them and, oh, I think this one's too long. I better do a shortened version of it. Dude, that's not doing me any good. It's not helping me figure out how to structure a story or how to, you know, those kind of things you just need to learn by writing. A lot of this stuff, I just wish I'd heard somebody say this stuff 10 years ago or more. So I wouldn't have wasted all that time doing things the wrong way and spinning my wheels and going nowhere. Now I'm spinning my wheels because I'm lazy and lame and not writing again, sadly. You know, I was so excited a few months ago, but since that day came and went, life has conspired to make things difficult. And so, yeah, here I am not writing again. And I think what I need to do is print some of these ones that were the most inspiring out and force myself to read them like once a week so that I keep in mind what it is that I need to do and keep that goal in front of me. Or This is some kind of religious conversion you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> just, let's see, I don't know. I, everybody's brain works differently and everybody's creative process works differently. And I've heard people just rail on the writers that would write, that would dare write an outline and stifle themselves and prevent themselves from any creativity or any inspiration. And I'm just not that guy. Uh -huh. And you'll hear people, they, they get so angry about it. It's just like Khrushchev banging his shoe on the podium about the, the outlines thing. And I just, okay, even you get a tap shoe and bang for all you want. I know that outlines are good for me. And yeah. a couple of the things that he said about just like, one of the things was like, writers groups will never accomplish anything. <laughs> and he's like, either you're way more talented than they are and you're friggin' slumming it and wasting your time or you're less talented than they are and they're friggin' slumming it and wasting your time. And I was just like, well, writers groups are good. I got a hand job one time from a writers group. What, <laughs> what the hell? Well, they what? are good for that, and I guess. So, I don't. I, I think you're simplifying what he has to say an awful lot and exaggerating what he has to say an awful yeah, lot. Yeah, uh, okay. I may be simplifying, what, but what? I don't have the text in front of me to quote from. And if you do, then fine. And I'll say yes, yes, I agree with that. Yes, I. Wow, no. 
Oh, I get that huge guy <laughs> slumming it. Yeah. Okay, Wallace, slow down here. Oh, I don't. Was that Wallace Shawn? I, when you that said, felt like a different character. When you said no, it, it really hit that Wallace Shawn note. I think that probably has to go with the rewriting thing and, and all that. But, you know, it's hard to some. I mean, there's. I don't know. We're looking at the list of them here now, and it looks like there's like twenty. Okay, well, do you remember he, he said that he used to print out his story the second he finished it, uh-huh. put it in an envelope, and mail it to a publisher, and then print out another copy and share that with his writer's group. Right. And I just thought, why? What? And the whole point of even going to that writer's group was that so if somebody didn't like this point and he agreed with them, he could incorporate it into a story further down the line. But that story that he was actually sharing with people was gone. It was mm-hmm. in the hands of editors or publishers. It's over. It's he over. It. Wait, it's what? the whole rewriting thing. You can want to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. And that's what he was saying. He had the gall to mail it to somebody first before taking it to his writer's workshop. But he would share it with people and he would get their feedback and he would find out from what they'd say, oh, I didn't believe your characters in this one. And so he'd realize what his weaknesses are. And the next time that he wrote a story, he could use that to focus his practice with. And so he would try especially to do that certain thing. And so, yeah, that's what he was saying. He wasn't saying that workshops were awful. He was just saying that you don't use them to polish your story. All right. Okay. Well, one of these we've got to just go to, (laughs) print out, go to the text and look and see. Because either I'm right or you're wrong. One of the two. And (laughs) I don't know. It's it's weird because I'm getting all fired up in the opposite way that you were (laughs) that day. But it's mostly just because the guy just... He, he he's from on high telling us these revelations that he's received. And then he goes on to say, I've had 137 books published in the last three months. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can do it, you can do it. And this is what I've learned. And I, But what's weird is if it were Michael Jordan talking about how he's to make a, a free throw, like mm-hmm. you were saying, I'd be like, oh, okay, this is how to make a free throw. I'll, I'll hold the basketball like that, or this will be my stance. And Clench your butt cheeks thusly. <laughs> there, there you go. Thank you, sir. But because he's a writer, I don't know why I'm just like, oh. And maybe that was what he's talking about, that I'm going to anger a lot of people with the things he I'm about to say. He does say that pretty much every post. He says, oh, this one's going to make people mad. And then he goes on to say the things that sends Rish bouncing around the room like uh, a gummy bear from that old cartoon. Did you ever see that cartoon, The Gummy Bears? No, I was having sex during that You cartoon. were not. Come on, sir. All right. See, it just doesn't work when I say it, does it? <laughs> it's it's not totally really. unbelievable. You said it, Big. So you clicked on this for any particular reason? I or? just figured this was one of the ones, the incendiary ones. And this one, actually, I really like just because he just talked about it. He was saying, yeah, 10 to 15 minutes, you get 250 words. Hour, you get 1,000 words. 90 days, doing an hour a day, you've got a 90,000-word book. How dare you invoke math in my presence? <laughs> he does math a lot in his things. <laughs> but, you know, I still stand by the statement that it is hard to write. It is hard to sit down, make yourself do it, when there's a thousand and one different distractions, and that's just the pornographic ones. There's sleep to be had. There's a hundred responsibilities. That's true. There are things that are easier to do than writing by far. Sitting on your butt and watching a movie or a TV or something, like that's much simpler because you don't even have to type when you're doing that, and you don't usually have to think. It's a different kind of hard than digging ditches Definitely. I mean, unless you have a crappy chair after a day of writing, you're not going to be like, oh, my back. Uh, you're not going to fall onto the bed and be like, oh, I'm so exhausted and fall right to sleep or something. But it's work. You have to really think. And you can't compare writing to basketball or something like that and then say it's not hard because basketball, that's physical. That's a lot of work to do. In the similar way that writing is. Yeah, you've got to go out and you've got to practice. You've got to learn and you've got to work and you've got to really think about writing. But it's fun. And so is basketball. That's why people do it. And so are, you know, sports and so are uh, playing music and things like that. They're rewarding in their own way. But they are hard work. Just different kind of hard work. 
We, you and I both lived in California. Uh-huh. And how many times did you run into somebody who had moved from Wisconsin? It's always Wisconsin. To, to write for the movies it's, or to write for TV or to write for The Simpsons or to write for... Somebody's got to write those pornos that are constantly being shot in Silicon so. Valley. I think they make those up on the spot nowadays. Well, okay. <laughs> I aspired to write for porno, all right? And you talk to them and be like, oh, so you came here to write. And they've never written a script before. And they don't know how the formatting works. They've not bothered to they learn any spell. of this stuff. But that's their complete thing because it's so easy or whatever. But they've never done it. <laughs> yep. And you're talking about, okay, it's not digging ditches or whatever. But most people have spent eight hours that day doing their job. And then in the time that's left, that's their writing time. Uh-huh. And so maybe that. these bastards do dig ditches and then there they have go. to come. They have to figure a way to get character one from point A to point F. And that's yeah. more, more, okay, it's not as bad as digging ditches, but it's still easier for him just to go to sleep. That's true. It most definitely. Sleep is much less work than writing. I'm sorry. And you know what? I will concede that maybe... People are listening to me and saying, you don't know what the F you're talking about. And why did you say F instead of the F word? Just the same way that I was about this guy. I mean, clearly this guy makes his living full time from writing. He owns his own home, which, <laughs> is, the, is, that. Is, which is my barometer for whether he you're a success or I, not. I believe he owns his home like on a cliff overlooking the ocean as well. So, so clearly he is a success. He knows what he's talking about. But I have listened to King talk, Stephen King, multimillionaire, and I've disagreed with the things that he's had to say, too. You know, Uh it's just – I mean, that guy gets up at 8 o'clock in the morning and writes until 5.30 or 6 o'clock every single day. That's a job for that guy. And so clearly that is work. Yeah, that's true. You know, one thing that he does say, and he, he said this in a very recent post, the myth that he's debunking is that there's only one way. And he's saying that every writer has a different way. And a lot of the things that he's saying here aren't going to work for you like they work for him. There's a lot of people like these guys that you talked about that said, Oh, you cannot use an outline. An outline is stifling and it takes away all creativity. That may be the way that they write and it may work great for them. Maybe they turn out amazing stories that way. But for you, it doesn't work, and your stories just meander until they eventually fall apart, and you give up on it and never finish. And so, yeah, I mean, that's definitely the truth. Everything works differently for different people. And he even said, he even admitted that maybe rewriting is okay for you, but not for him. So, you know, I guess you got to keep reading them. And I think he, as he writes these posts, is opening his eyes a little bit to the way things may be out there. And, and you know, he started out saying, yeah, you don't have to have an agent until you've already mailed your book into an editor and an editor has said they want it. Then you get the agent and the agent will negotiate the contract for you. And recently he's completely changed his mind on that. And he says, you know, you don't have to have an agent at all. An agent is not necessary. And they're going to charge you 15% of everything you make anyways. And he's saying, yeah, you know, you maybe there's a, a way to do it without an agent. You can just get a, a lawyer to negotiate your contract for you. And that guy's just going to charge you for the hours that he worked. And he's not going to take a percentage forever. And so you might get this stuff done a lot cheaper. And I think he's decided to do it that way himself. So he changes his mind. As time has gone by, I don't know how long it's been since he first started doing this, but I think it's probably been more than a year since he first started writing these little posts every now and then. I've found recently that they've become much more agent-heavy, much more talking about whether you need an agent, what an agent should do, how agents rip people off, etc., etc., etc. He's he's really gotten onto that kick. Well, maybe that's something specific that he's mentioned that other people aren't talking about, that beginning writers or writers that have just gotten their feet in the door really don't know. And they're like, well, hey, I know how to rewrite or not to rewrite right. writers groups or whatever it might be. I don't know anything about the agents in there. And that's the way I felt when I first read it. Although at a certain point, I'm starting to think, you know, I, I just need to go back and read the ones that are about actually writing because that's the part that I have a problem with now. Um, someday, when I've actually finished a book, then I can start worrying about having an agent or not having an agent or whatever. But I need to get to the point that I actually finish a book. Uh, one thing, though, that I think that they're, they're pretty darn cool, and I think that they kind of apply to everybody, really, 
is uh, he, he mentions Heinlein's five simple business rules. Number one rule, you must write to be a writer. And that's already problem number one for me. <laughs> I can't just talk about writing like you and I do on the show all the time, but not do it. I just need to set out a time. I'm going to write a certain amount every day. And if it's late at night and I haven't written yet, maybe I need to sit down and do it for a little while before I can let myself go to sleep. I don't know. I have to figure out a way to make that work. Number two, the rule is you must finish what you write. You can't just start stories, start stories. Oh, I don't like this one. I'll do this other one. Start it. Oh, I don't like this one. Oh, I certainly fall prey to that particular yeah. weakness. Yeah, I've, I have a story right now that's languishing. Yeah, I'm on like the last scene and I just haven't written it. Rule number three, you must never rewrite unless to editorial demand. Uh, and he's not saying you don't correct your spelling errors or your typos or, you know, somebody tells you some grammar error or something like that. He's talking more changing a character all the way around or making the ending changing different the or story. changing the story, something like that. Don't do that because some Joe Blow from your writer's group told you to do that. If an editor who wants to buy the story tells you to do that, then maybe you should. Otherwise, write a new story is the idea. Keep going, practice, and move on. Rule number four is you must mail what you write to someone who can buy it. Your world frightens and confuses me. <laughs> and that's kind of a hard thing to do because you know that you are going to get rejected and it's going to happen probably a lot to begin with. And so there's a lot of fear involved in that, but you're not going anywhere with it if you don't send it out to be read by someone who can buy it. And then rule number five is keep it in the mail until someone buys it. Keep sending it out is what you mean. That's right. Once it's rejected it. one time, it's not, oh, okay, well, I need to rewrite it or I need to tinker with it for another year and then I'll send it out again. Once it comes back to you, send it to the next place. Comes back to you, send it to the next place. Also recently, I was reading what Tobias Bakel had to say about his experience as becoming a writer and learning to write. He was saying that he wanted to get published but he couldn't really set as a goal, I will be published by this time, because it wasn't a goal that he was really in control of, you know? An editor has to look at it and say, okay, I want to buy this. So instead, he made a goal of, I'm going to try and get 100 rejection letters in this year. And basically what that means is he kept his stories circulating out there. He continued to mail it until somebody bought it. Maybe he got an acceptance letter along with all of those rejection letters, or maybe he didn't. But he was doing his part to get there. I think that's really cool, and that was a, a goal that he made. It's something that anybody can do. I mean, you can even stick your rejection letters up on the wall and make a um, collage out of it or something. I don't know, but do something fun with it. That was one thing that I aspired to do, and I sent out one story, and I haven't sent out another so I really need to put my money where my mouth is and, and actually get going and do these things. Anyways, I'd recommend reading these blog posts that Dean Wesley Smith has done. Whether you agree with them like I did for the most part or don't agree with them like Rish did for the most part, if nothing else, they are something that can get you thinking about it. And uh, maybe there'll be some things that'll really inspire you and work for you and you can get moving and uh, you can become the Tiger Woods or the Michael Jordan of writing. I don't know. <laughs> the, the Mary Lou Retton. There you writing. go. Perfect 10. You know, I don't know if people dig listening to us talk about writing. I know there are some people that say, hey, you should talk about writing all the time because you guys are both writers and you have writers on the show and, and then... There are other people that say, oh, I love it when you guys do top 10 lists, or I love it when you do ethnic stereotype voices. <laughs> so if you like us talking about writing, dude, we could go on. We could do a three-hour episode just yeah. talking about what we all – I always wanted to talk about writers' groups and what uh, my writers' group experience was like. And I always wanted to talk about that a-hole creative writing teacher <laughs> I had in college that to this day, the things that that guy said echo in my mind. And so, you know, everybody has their experiences and everybody has their opinions and all that stuff. And if you want to talk more or have more of a dialogue or mention in the comments. Definitely uh, leave a comment if you've got something to say about this. And check them out at deanwesleysmith.com and I'll put a, a link in the show notes for it. 
All right, so that's our show. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, contributing so much, R O eight O T. Yeah. Wait, what did he say? Uh, oh, hey, another thing. When we had the 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 alternate robot, the what do you want to call it? Alternate universe robot? No, the multiverse robot. robot. <laughs> what? No, what, what do you call somebody that comes in and, and stands in for somebody else? A substitute? When we had the substitute robot, it was so cool to actually know what the guy was saying and just be able to interact. To me, that was that was interesting. But uh, now we've got our OHT again. So uh, there was a time that I actually considered, because, you know, that's an upgrade that we can get for OHT. Do you think we sh- should see if we can get OHT a voice chip? Oh, but then I would be able to hear the horrible things that he says to me <laughs> or about me. Well, there is that. I don't know. I, is it expensive to get something like this? A little bit. I don't, maybe. How about this? If we get a donation, then we can get O8OT a voice chip. What do you think of that? Oh, well, that's fine because we're not going to get a donation. <laughs> I mean, people don't donate when we say uh, we pay our authors and we want to be able to bring more stories that aren't written by me to the air. You really think people are going to donate when it's like, oh, I want to hear him say F you, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> you might be surprised how many fans 08 OT has. Okay, that, that, there you go. Cliffhanger ending, as you mentioned <laughs> like an hour ago. I think that that'll be it. We didn't talk much about the werewolf story, and I'm I'm a little embarrassed about that because I love werewolves so much. Uh, somebody corrected me, sir, to pre- when my wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty. I corrected her. Somebody corrected me on my werewolf lore, and it uh-huh. drove me bug bug to use the parlance of the other stuff. <laughs> when I said the Siad Mac version of the werewolf, nobody was like, oh, this guy may know what he's talking about. They just instantly assumed that I was an idiot. Or a f- but So we won't talk about that or include the f- type line in okay. this episode. Uh, I, I do really like werewolves, and I like the idea of a, a woman who doesn't realize that she's a werewolf. That's pretty cool. I, I think the woman realized she was a werewolf. She just couldn't remember how to transform anymore. Oh. I guess I should have paid attention. (laughs) (laughs) We did finally get a werewolf story in, though. or We already had one, didn't we? What was the other story? Light Cats and Dogs. Ah, yes. That one had werewolves of a sort in it. Very popular episode of ours. And this one had werewolves of a sort as well. Okay, so So we we really need a vampire story, though. Dang. Werewolves are kicking butt these but, well, days. What about that one about Forrest Gump and he, he gets <laughs> infected by Lieutenant Dan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think that actually happened. Oh, I think okay. you're imagining this whole thing. <sighs> oh, but wait, you know, there's one thing. Abby has the other podcast. I mean, we've mentioned oh, it already. Catchers one. Yeah, the Cowrie Catchers. <laughs> yeah, we both do voices on that. You have multiple characters and that's still going, right? Yes. She sent us out a new uh, promo. To go with that. So maybe we ought to play that while we're here. I okay. mean, it's her story today and everything, so it would make a lot of sense. And you and I will continue to fight during the promo. Okay? <laughs> All right. That's perfect. Roll that 08 OT. For 300 years, the sea dragons have ruled as gods over the islands of Wefravain. They have used us as slaves, as food. Their priesthood's authority was unquestioned. Until now. I am Gwaine. Together with my guild of pirates and rebels, I'm taking on High Priestess Morcella and her wyvern masters. We sink her ships, steal her riches, assassinate her lieutenants, and spread the message of freedom throughout the islands. Now she sent someone to stop me. Gerard, the latest captain of her temple police. Unlike the others I've killed, he's smart, capable, even honorable. Under other circumstances, we might have been friends, but he's working for the wrong side. I will free my people, no matter what. If Gerard wants a hunt, I'll give him one. Guild of the Cowrie Catchers, a fantastic high seas adventure by Abigail Hilton, featuring the voice talents of Nathan Lowell, Norm Sherman, Kim, the comic book goddess, Chris Lester, and many more. Now playing at cowrycatchers.com. That's C O W R Y catchers.com. Catch me if you can, Gerard, before I catch you.
Okay. If that doesn't make you want to listen to it, I don't know what will. Bisexual Norm Sherman. There you go. So uh, since we recorded last, the Parsec Awards have come and gone. That's right. Yeah, they did come and go. And I, I just mentioned Norm Sherman. The Drabblecast won, uh, what was it, Best? Best um, Speculative Fiction Magazine or Anthology Podcast is what he won. And rightly so. That's yeah. a great podcast. You probably already know if you if you listen to us. In fact, right about the time this episode's hitting, you and I are helping him on yet another episode. That's right. And there's even a uh, upcoming trifecta that we got to take a part in, too. Yeah, he actually let us read one of the stories, which I think is neat. So that's cool. But yeah, we were also nominated for a Parsec. Ours was best short story. Right. And, and of yeah. course we didn't win. I mean, I didn't really expect that we would. Especially once I saw that the name Scott Sigler was also among the nominees. And uh, he ended up winning. He did, yeah. I think he got like four nominations this year. How can he manage to get into all the different categories like that? I don't know, but well, but he you, seems to really understand how this whole podcast, poly- how this whole podcasting world, pod, podis, what is that word? I swear I would never the say podosphere. It. How that whole podosphere works. He's like a god among podcasters when it comes down to. He's like the dude who started podcasting his novels and then parlayed that right into a best-selling novelist career. Someone like us going against someone like him is. Well, I mean, it wasn't just us. We did that's have true. a great Mike Resnick story to get us nominated that's, in the first place. True. And and I think any of the uh, thanks for our, our nomination has to go to that story. Cause yeah, I think most definitely. If it was a story by Rich Outfield, it would have been considered for about ha- half a minute and then we'd moved on. I think Big is right. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that really helped. And, you know, we were up against, I think, some stiff competition there was a Tim Pratt story. Yeah, the Tim Pratt story. There is that uh, The Things by Peter Watts. And I know that uh, Peter Watts is getting a fair amount of love because of the trouble that he's had within the last year. It stems from a crossing of the Canadian border where he tried to go across and ran into uh, problems with the border guards that wound up in him being convicted. With that kind of competition... The fact that we got nominated, I thought was really cool, and I was pretty excited about that. And as far as it goes, that was really enough for me. To be considered a top five podcast is is something pretty special, I think, especially considering how many podcasts there are. Something you can hang your hat on. Cheers, guys. So they send out a little Parsec finalist thing that you can put on your website. And so I went ahead and threw a banner. Yeah, you could call it a banner. A button button yeah you could call it a button you could just call it a picture too some, some people call it a sling blade <laughs> so i went ahead and threw that on there um onto our site just so that we could boast and brag a little bit not that anybody ever goes to our site but you know it's all good one other thing before we finish last week we talked about that podcast that you did the reading for it was that word that i can't say cast macabre macabre wasn't it Yes. Okay. Thank you. We talked about that story. Well, they sent us over a promo to play. And since we played Abby's promo, I figured we might as well go ahead and uh, play theirs as well. It's short and sweet. Barry's gotten a lot of really good readers to do stories. He got Alistair Stewart on there. He got Norm Sherman. So I'm in great company there. Nice. We'll be right back after these messages. (laughs) Oh, the horror. No pseudopod until October. How will we cope? If you're missing your weekly dose of horror audio fiction, check out Cast Macabre at castmacabre.org and in iTunes. (laughs) So there you go. No... whammies (laughs) whammies <laughs> no pseudopod until october so this guy can just slip right in there and fill that terrible void i'd like to fill her void oh back in the box club i guess uh, i guess that's all we got today right or do we have more do you have more I just wait for the hate mail to come pouring through and we can <laughs> spend some <laughs> time waiting through that oh yes that should be fun 
shoot, I forgot. We have one more thing that we got to get in today. What, what, what is it? A longtime friend of the show. We've done a couple of his stories here as well. Mr. Kevin Anderson. Kevin David Anderson. Oh, yeah. He is just publishing his first novel right now. And since we're cool and all that, we have copies. Well, a copy to give away. Just a copy? One copy? We have a copy and two posters. Okay. Of his first novel. Now, his first novel is called Night of the Living Trekkies by Kevin David Anderson and Sam Stahl. A collaboration, which, of course, we have long since decided that we just can't do. I can't do a solo story either, but that's beside the point. We have two copies of Night of the Living Trekkies. You know, one of those was actually supposed to be for us to read and so we can give our opinion. Should we give it away or? Look, by the time this episode airs, I'm sure I could read a, a you know, a zombie Star Trek story. I, I, it's oh, right okay. up my alley, so. That's true, yeah. Um, okay, so we have two slightly used copies <laughs> of Night of the Living Trekkies. We would like to disperse to the community. And we also have two posters. What do the posters look like? Is it just the cover? They look like the cover. A dead Trekkie. Undead, sir. Oh, sorry, you're right. So how do we determine who gets the book and who gets the posters? And Well, I thought we'd do a little contest. And I figured the top two winners of the contest get books. And then the next two get posters. Those contests never end well. Yeah, that's true. We'll be lucky to get four entrants. But so that there, makes it easy. There is that, but that does make it easy. Maybe we won't have to give away both these books. <laughs> <laughs> I think this contest was your brainchild, sir. What? Why don't you explain it to us? Oh, well, the other day we were talking, you said that you played, uh, you used to play doctor with all the neighborhood girls. Yeah, and... but that wasn't supposed to be on air. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. That was a slip of the tongue, much like your game of doctor. <laughs> uh, you used to play two truths and a lie to get into While playing girls' doctor. bedrooms. But the, oh, wow. We see what you did there. And, and I thought, wow, I haven't played two truths and a lie since. I've never played two truths and a lie. So I thought it would be fun if we played it on the air and uh, the listener can see if they can pick the lie. Uh, basically, you make three statements. Two of them are factual and one of them is inventual. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one of them is untrue. Oh, and if okay. the now, if, if you're playing it as a parlor game, your opponents try and figure out, okay, well, this one has to be true, and this is, uh, I'll bet the third one is a lie or whatever. And if they're right, do you make out with them? I mean, how does that... Something like that. I don't know. See, I live vicariously through <laughs> your memories, basically. <laughs> so let's do that. We'll play a couple of rounds, and then the listener can send in his guesses, or her guesses, and uh, whoever is closest to correct wins the books. Wins, wins a the... book... Or a poster. So, thing number one, category number one that we'll each do. This, so, this this category is family. Now, my family is uh, is a bit unusual. Oh. We're kind of like hillbilly-esque, you might say, in my family. So, let me uh, tell you the unusual things that my family are. Number one, I am the seventh of ten children. And I also have five Step brothers and sisters. Fifteen. My oldest nephew is older than my youngest brother. Number three. I have three siblings who all have had children on the exact same day as their own birthday. Three. three have a child that was born on the same day as their birthday. Okay, go. All right, so my family category. Number one, I have two Uncle Georges, two <laughs> Uncle Sams, and three Uncle Jims. I have an Uncle Sam, too. I'm a real-life nephew of my Uncle Sam, born on the 4th of July. Uh, are we at a tea? Can we edit? <laughs> Let's just take this whole game out, please. Question uh, number two, statement number two, all of my grandparents... Are dead. Statement number three. I have an aunt. I have an aunt 
that I am 15 years older than. Wow. That's similar to mine, but much more extreme. Okay, the next category is injuries. Injuries. That's right. Everybody has good injury stories. So, number one, I once fell off of an exercise bicycle. This was a stationary. You know what I'm talking about. Vaguely. Not a bike that actually moves. An exercise bicycle. Stationary bicycle. And while falling off, a bolt on the exercise bicycle punched a nickel-sized hole in my thigh, which required stitches. Zink! Bum zink zink! Number two. I broke the same finger twice within six months. And one of these times, the doctor gave me a cast all the way to my elbow for no better reason than just to punish me. Zink zink! <laughs> Number three, once, while helping my dad put up Christmas lights, I fell off the second story. My house was two stories tall. I fell from the second story and landed on our wood pile, receiving only minor scratches. Zoom, cheek! <laughs> All right, my injuries are, one, I have gotten electrocuted. Two, I have been kicked by a horse. Three, I have gotten my foot torn up in a motorcycle chain. Ooh. Okay, so because Kevin's book is about Star Trek, uh -huh. oh. I thought we would have a round where we discuss Star Trek. Oh, okay. So should I go first or should you go first? My Star Trek, falsities and truities. I have never seen a single frame of video from an episode of Voyager or Enterprise. Now, that's not a big deal because nobody watched Enterprise, but... Or Voyager. Not one second of either of those shows. And how many seasons do they go for? Seven and four. There you go. When the last Star Trek movie came out, I bought a Star Trek shirt, a red shirt, from a cereal box offer. I think it was Frosted Flakes. And I wore it to my work Halloween party. And every year they have everybody stand up there with their costumes and do kind of like a contest. So I was up there and I won the contest from the sheer improbability of me being caught dead in a Star Trek red shirt. Or I have seen every single Star Trek film ever ever made, including being their opening weekend to see the worst of them all, The Final Frontier. Or is Nemesis the worst of them all? Which do you think? I like Final Frontier much more than Nemesis, yeah. but I think okay. people tend to say the fifth one is the worst. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so my Star Trek Two Truths and a Lie are, one, I once said, oh bye, to George, Mr. Sulu, to K. No way in hell. Next. Number two. Sir Patrick Stewart and I have the same birthday. No way in hell. Stop it. Next. And number three. I once put my arm around William Shatner. Did you get aroused? I, th I think that would give away whether it's true or not, so. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Okay, and we're also going to do the zombie half of this. So here's my two truths and one lie about zombies. Number one, I once played a part in a zombie Christmas story. Now that's ridiculous. I've done it. Number two, last year I dressed all three of my children as oozing zombies for Halloween. There's pictures. <laughs> they didn't want to either. I made them. <laughs> Number three. In my entire life, I've only seen one zombie film ever. Wait, wait. Michael Jackson's Thriller? Oh, <laughs> uh, Does that count as a zombie film? No. I mean, that's just a music video. Okay, two zombie films. Okay. Zombies for me. Zombies for you. One. I once handed in a zombie story as an assignment for an English class. Number two. 
I own George Romero's zombie trilogy on video cassette, but not DVD. <laughs> Number three, I have never been a zombie for Halloween. I'm a zombie. I'm 16. All right, so there's our contest, folks. If you want to hop onto the computer and send an email, tell us which one you think is which. I guess if you could get all eight of them, then we'll go by whoever gets theirs turned in first. And, and just then... send that to uh, editor at doonsteef.com. That's right. And we'll send you along a beautiful, shiny new Night of the Living Trekkies by Kevin David Anderson and Sam Stahl. While we're speaking on this subject, we do have, finally, a Yay! zombie-related story coming up. Two. Two, okay. Hello. And, and so, we thought, since we're asking people to participate in the show anyway, uh, yes, you may donate. But oh my. <laughs> also, if you have a microphone and you are up for it, we would love to have people... Record some zombie moaning and some zombie you know, noises. Growling and groaning. and um, Just so that we'll have a whole bunch of zombies to sounds to overlay in that episode. I, what we were going to do was just email all of our contributing voice actors and have them do zombie sounds. But So you're now put on notice, contributing voice actors. Please send us some zombie noises, if you would. But if you are listening... And you'd like to do that, just record them as an MP3. You know, just a, a, a little bit of that eerie, you know, the yeah. kind of thing. And then maybe more of, a, you know, zombies attacking right. louder, scarier. Not scary, louder, more uh, Aggressive. Aggressive, there you go. And that also just send to editor at doonsteef.com, right? That's right. And you will have a... What do they call that? A walk-on part on a dude's teeth. A shamble-on part. <laughs> there you go. All right. So I guess uh, that's the show, eh? Oh, well, yeah. Until we come up with another thing we forgot to mention. <laughs> well, thanks for listening, folks. And please donate so 080T can unleash his fury upon the world. Don't donate. Just spend your money on filth. <laughs> There's much filth to be found. It varies in price. All right. Although really, with the internet now, there's no need to ever spend a dime on filth. <laughs> I suppose so. All right, so I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Thanks for listening, folks. Good night. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Take two. This has been a Fallopian Tubes production. Take that, bitches! Well, where did the German come? Oh, from the story itself. Yeah. Fallopian Tubes. That also Ooh, came from the story. Ooh, bitches. <laughs> that was the strangest thing. Is that the name of her production company? Would she go that far? No, I don't think so. I think she was just saying that because it was all women involved and not us. Have you ever seen a fallopian tube? It's all right. We're all friends here. Like, you know, on the side of the road when you're driving at night. <laughs> I don't or... think so. I have forgotten how to vivalden. I have forgotten how to viv... I looked it up. Hold on. I have forgotten how to vivalden. 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 I have forgotten how to vivalden. Verwandeln. 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 I was looking for something that was clearly public domain. Sorry. Um, I'm going to mutter something from Goethe. <laughs> as I said, it's not going to be anything otherwise. So I might as well give you something. But it's either that or the lyrics to Rock Me Amadeus. So... <laughs> Über allen Gefällen ist Ruh in allen Gefällen spürst du kaum einen Hoch, die Vogel ein Schweigen in Walda, Walda nur Walda, Ruh hast du auch. 
Hafti Schwabisch Eisenbahn, gibt's gar die Lehrerstation, schüttet gar um ein Biberrock, mecke Bürre, Tulles Bach, Trülle, 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 La, Trülle, 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 La, stut gar um ein Biberrock, mecke Bürre, Tulles Bach, Trülle, 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 La, Trülle, 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 La, was uns sonst das Post und blies, pfeifet jetzt die Lokomotiv. It's an old kid song. I'm not sure if it's even close, but it gives you something to work with. Character who had just stuck a finger in an electrical socket. Character who had just stuck a finger in the... Who had just stuck a finger in an electrical socket. Who had just stuck a finger in an electrical socket. Who had just stuck a finger in an electrical socket. This has been a Fallopian Tubes production. Take that, bitches! Yeah, well, if you too.